Stanford University. But thank you very much, and thank you for for coming uh, to a topic which perhaps is not uh, necessarily at the top of the bestseller list. Um, Southeast Asia is a part of the world that we don't often think about, which is actually probably good news because the places we do think about tend to be locations where wars are in progress, uh, natural disasters are unfolding. And Southeast Asia has, of course, seen its share of bloodshed and calamity over the decades. Uh, I dare say many of the people in this room remember the Vietnam War. I certainly do. But fortunately, in recent times, Southeast Asia has been a relatively stable, relatively peaceful economic uh, dynamo, uh, so that it's nice to be working on a part of the world where uh, its visibility is not dependent upon bad news. Um, the White House, for security reasons, is reluctant to release too far in advance the itinerary of President Obama. So uh, I do not have a security clearance. Uh, that's another obstacle. Uh, I tried to find out what it was, and I failed to do so. But my estimation is that a week from Thursday, uh, which is the 4th of November, right after the election, not before, uh, right after the election, uh, President Obama will depart for what looks to be a 10-day trip to Asia. Uh, we do know the itinerary. He will go to India. From India, he will go to Indonesia. From Indonesia, he will go to South Korea. And from South Korea, he will go to Japan and then presumably he will uh, return. Um, this is actually a fairly unusual sequence, if I may say so. If you take a look at the itineraries of previous presidents over the decades, you will find Europe is by far the most prominent and frequent destination. Uh, not Asia. But President Obama claims to be, in his own words, the first Pacific president the United States has ever had. We know that that refers in part to the four years that he spent in Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, from 1967 to 1971, presumably formative years. I knew his mother. I don't believe I ever saw him. He would have been about yay high. She was working for the Ford Foundation, and I would come into the Ford Foundation. I was a graduate student at the time to write up my notes, uh, and she was there. And he may have been running around in the background, but I don't remember. <clears throat> in any case, in addition to having spent that time in Indonesia, an extraordinary background for a president of the United States, I must say, quite unique, he also spent much more time in Hawaii. And so the claim to be a Pacific president has a kind of what, biographical uh, ring to it. Yes, uh, in some sense he is. And it's not just a question of his biography. A decision has been made by the US government, quite striking, quite remarkable, and rather gratifying to those of us that work on Asia, that this is, in many respects, the future of the planet. Not just demographically, which we expected, with China, by far the largest country in the world, India, the second most populous country in the world, uh, <clears throat> not to mention Indonesia, but also because of the economic dynamism of this part of the world. Um, the real question going into the G20, the Group of 20 summit in Seoul, which President Obama will attend, is what kind of a negotiation, a balance, an agreement might be reached between China and the United States, particularly on currency issues. I'm not going to get into that uh, with you this afternoon, except to say that the fact that the G20 is meeting in Asia, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum is meeting thereafter in Yokohama, and Obama will be there as well. APEC, as, is it, as it's called, groups together countries around the Pacific Rim, which together constitute a great chunk, more than half, of the global economy. So decisions made in Asia are of global importance. And this administration recognizes that and has moved with remarkable speed. <laughs> Bureaucracies, especially inside the Beltway, tend to be very sluggish. 
But it's quite remarkable. Hillary Clinton has made it clear to the State Department that Asia really matters. And she has taken trip after trip after trip. The United States is on the verge of joining the East Asia Summit. And Obama not only will be in Indonesia in November, he will go back. One hopes he has unfortunately had to postpone several plans to go to Indonesia. So what happens a year from now, hard to predict. But he is scheduled to go back to Indonesia next year uh, to attend the East Asia Summit. We can get into the sort of diplomatic aspects of this reaching out to Asia, but it's a remarkable phenomenon and very, very interesting to watch. Not just from the standpoint of a specialist such as myself, but I think uh, from a larger perspective, Americans who are going to be increasingly interacting with and dependent upon their partners in Asia. Now what I want to do today is to zero in on two countries, that is to say Thailand. I'm sorry that this map <laughs> is not a political map. It's a little bit, it should have clear cut boundaries around countries, but it doesn't. Um, Thailand is located right here. How many of you have been to Thailand? How, how many of you have been to Indonesia? Oh. I'm, I'm not surprised by the number who have been to Thailand. I am a little surprised that as many of you have been to Indonesia as raised your hands. Well, I will skip a lot of the intro, but not all of it, um, and just simply say that I am going to focus today on Thailand and Indonesia, and in particular, look at the question of democracy. It is, I think, not a coincidence that aside from Obama's four destinations all being in Asia, they are all democratic countries. Uh, you might or might not agree with me, but my, and I'm certainly not an expert about this country, but my guess is that American national identity is all about democracy. My guess is that the United States is not a country that rests upon ethnic identity, upon religious identity, but we take these truths to be self-evident. You know, think about that for a moment. What could be, in a way, more arrogant than, you know, I don't even have to give you any proof that freedom, freedom is the name of the game. Freedom is what matters. Democracy is what matters. I think the Declaration of Independence really is at the heart of what it means to be an American. And we then look at the outside world, if I may say this, and want to ask the question, well, who else is with us? Who else is out there that is also a democracy? In my racket, in academe, uh, political scientists have developed a proposition called democratic peace theory. Democratic peace theory. What is democratic peace theory? Democratic peace theory is the idea that two democracies will never, ever fight each other. OK, you've got to say each other. You know, we fought fascism during World War II, that's different. They will never fight each other. Now, if that's true, and there's a debate about that, which I won't get into unless you want to during the discussion, if that's true, then it follows that democracy will lead to security. The more countries are democratic, the fewer the conflicts, the fewer the wars, the more the security. There's a second set of arguments which are, which are harder to maintain. Harder to maintain, I have to admit that says not only is democracy good for security, but it's good for prosperity. Uh, how many of you have ever been to Singapore? Well, those of you uh, who have been to Singapore and those of you who haven't, having perhaps uh, read about conditions in Singapore, will understand that Singapore is an incredibly successful economy, but not exactly a democracy. It's led by an elite. In the old days, we used to say, Lee Kuan Yew knows best. He was sort of the founder and the longtime prime minister of, of Singapore. And one has to credit the elite in Singapore with having made some remarkable decisions. There are people who come from urban areas all over the world to Singapore to study, for example, how they have solved traffic congestion. Peak hour pricing is showing up in the United States, borrowed, if I may say so, directly from the Singapore experience. So it's possible to be talented and autocratic at the same time. However much, if I may say so, Americans might want to resist that notion. Um, I think there's a temptation. We're an optimistic people. 
good things go together, right? So democracy goes together with prosperity. That's got to be the case. Well, it isn't necessarily the case. But it is sometimes the case. And for ever, every enlightened authoritarian, such as Lee Kuan Yew, there are the Idi Amin's of the world, brutal dictators uh, who repress their populations and impoverish them. Now, what makes Thailand and Indonesia particularly interesting is they have very divergent historical experiences with democracy. In recent years, and that will be my focus, I'm not a historian, <laughs> one has to conclude, I think, that democracy in Thailand has failed and is failing, and not just a question of the past tense. The violence we saw in April and May of this year with uh, nearly 100 people killed, maybe 13, 1,400 people injured, a clash between the so-called reds and the yellows, these two factions that are incredibly polarized, that have essentially dedicated themselves to the destruction of the other, as a consequence of which the consensus, the comity, the understanding that is surely an essential necessity for democracy to function has been absent in the Thai case. And the question now is, you know, will it lapse into civil war? And yet Thailand has had an experience with democracy, for example, in the mid-1970s. It has had a very checkered experience, I must say. If you take the period from 1932, when constitutional democracy first began in Thailand, until the latest coup in 2006, Thailand suffered either 19 or 18 coups, depending upon how you define a coup. We won't get into that which, to my count, works out on average about a coup every four years. With the military intervening, bloodshed, uh, it's not been a pretty picture. Now, in Indonesia, we have a very different situation. Indonesia was ruled by Suharto, uh, an authoritarian leader, uh, certainly no question about that, for more than 30 years. I first went to Jakarta in 1967 as a graduate student. That's, as I say, when young Obama was was there, nothing like dropping a name. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and I remember 1967 very well because it was the very beginning of what was called at that time the new order, as opposed to the old order of President Sukarno, who had actually declared the independence of Indonesia back in 1945 and was, in a sense, the founder of Indonesia. Now, Sukarno's regime was authoritarian. There was a period of democracy briefly in the 1950s it didn't work out. One of the reasons it didn't work out is because it didn't perform. Going back to my comment about Lee Kuan Yew and Singapore, think of two different ways of approaching democracy. One is as a matter of faith. Democracy is wonderful. It's, it's, it means to be human. It means dignity. If we have democracy and the GDP grows one percentage point less per year, never mind. It's still worth it compared to a dictatorship. Freedom is that important. All right, well, let's, let's increase that 1% to 2% drop because of democracy. How about 3%? How about 4%? What if you put in democracy and you end up with chaos and massive unemployment? And somebody stands up on the street and says, we don't want this democracy. We've had enough of this. Let's try something else. Let's try the Singapore model. <laughs> you can understand the rationale behind that. If I may say so, most of the people on the planet, here's a big generalization for which I confess I don't have impeccable proof, think of democracy in instrumental terms, the way you would think of a fork. If the fork helps you eat the spaghetti, great. If it doesn't, then use something else. A very practical approach. It was Deng Xiaoping, we recall, who said, I don't care if the cat is black or white. The question is, does it catch mice? What is the efficacy of democracy? That's the real issue. In the 1950s in Indonesia, it proved, shall I say, to be inefficacious. Now, there are lots of other reasons. There was an ambitious military man involved. Sukarno, hardly a Democrat. There are lots of explanations for the failure of democracy in the 1950s. But what is remarkable is that after 30 years, actually more than 30 years, of authoritarian leadership, accompanied by dramatic economic growth. Dramatic economic growth. In 1998, <clears throat> finally, the dictator resigned, and Indonesia embarked upon its current experiment with democracy, a successful experiment, despite lots of 
drawbacks. Corruption is still a significant problem. There are fringe Muslims who engage in intolerant behavior with regard to Christian minorities. There are lots of imperfections in Indonesia. But Freedom House, that some of you may have heard of, an organization in New York that ranks countries in the world according to how democratic they are, says that Indonesia is not only the most democratic country in all of Southeast Asia, among all 10 Southeast Asian countries, but is the only one that they classify as fully free, as opposed to not free and unfree. Needless to say, the government of Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, the president of Indonesia, who will welcome Obama in a couple of weeks when he arrives in Jakarta, is delighted to have this grade on his record to be presiding over the freest country in Southeast Asia. And you can be sure that when Obama arrives in Indonesia, he will bring that topic up again and again, how proud we are as Americans, because you know we are Democrats. As I say, it's part of our national identity. When somebody else looks like us, that makes us happy, right? Now, the other thing to say about Indonesia, of course, is that it has, as some of you I'm sure know, most of you perhaps, more Muslims than any other country. It is not an Islamic state. Very important to keep that in mind. It is not an Islamic state. If we define an Islamic state as a state in which the Quran is the constitution, run according to Islamic law, to Sharia, then, sorry, no way is Indonesia an Islamic state. It is not. It is not, in my judgment, even a Muslim country because although 87% approximately, well, if you round it, 88% of the population of Indonesia profess the Muslim religion, most of these people, you know, we think of Sunday Christians who show up, maybe they you know, want to show up the latest clothing that they've just picked up or whatever just to be seen by their neighbors. They're really quite secular. You know, there's some folks who are not Sunday Christians. They're Easter Christians. That's the one day of the year when you find them in church, right? Well, there are Friday Muslims who will go to the congregational prayer, perhaps, and who may fast, but who do not obey the other requirements of their religion. It is not a contradiction in terms to speak of a secular Muslim. I know a lot of them. And of course, most of them, the overwhelming majority, are quite tolerant, quite open to other faiths. And let's remember that when roughly 12% of the population is either Hindu, Buddhist, Catholic, Protestant, uh, and a number of other variations that we could get into, Indonesia is a very diverse place and it is headed by a government that is committed to a trans-religious identity. Uh, there are problems. Churches have been burned. Uh, there have been terrorist acts in Indonesia. Uh, these are risks and dangers for democracy, I admit. But there's no indication whatsoever that Indonesia is about to become anything even vaguely resembling an Islamic state. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was in Jakarta. We were doing a documentary. We were interviewing the president of Indonesia. In the course of that documentary, the person who was doing the interview referred to Indonesia as a Muslim country. <laughs> uh, and it is a Muslim majority country, absolutely, no question about that. But I had to intervene and say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You know, let's, let's be careful. Let's talk about Indonesia as a country with more Muslims than any other. That's fine. That's certainly true. But it is not a Muslim country. Uh, it's explicitly based on the acceptance of Christianity, of Hinduism, of Buddhism, of Confucianism as legitimate religions in which one can exercise one's beliefs. So in any case, having said that, the fact that this is the largest Muslim majority country to be a democracy, it is in fact the third largest democracy in the world, leads I think many Americans, including President Obama himself, to say this shows you that Islam and democracy are not incompatible, that they can go together. And that's another theme I'm sure that will come out repeatedly in the speeches that one can expect President Obama to make uh, while he is in Indonesia. Now, what the question here is why did Indonesia take one path towards what appears to be a successful democracy? They've had a series of elections. The elections have been peaceful, relatively, uh, not entirely, but relatively peaceful, nothing really serious. They've been relatively fair. 
and there are elected institutions from the top to the bottom of the country. How did this happen, whereas Thailand veered off the track somehow and ended up in this really uh, extraordinarily depressing situation of endless conflict? Uh, especially since 2008, Thai politics has been marked by intransigence and violence and depression and despair on the part of Democrats that wanted the country to keep on that particular track. Now the answer to this question, or I should say the answers to this question are, are multiple. And I'm not sure that I have time to get into equal depth in both cases. Let me start briefly with Thailand. I mean, more of you have been to Thailand. Maybe you can relate to this uh, more than um, perhaps to, to Indonesia. I think there are three explanations. I'm kind of making this up as I go along, frankly, <clears throat> but at least it's spontaneous. <laughs> I think there are three explanations. There's a demographic explanation, there's an economic, or a class actually, a class explanation, and then there's the most sensitive of all, which is an institutional explanation, and I'll get to that in a second. The demographic explanation is this. Um, the concentration of the population in Bangkok is absolutely extraordinary and has been for decades. When I first started teaching political science, and I would do an introduction to the politics of Southeast Asia, I would always point out that the urban primacy, that's a sort of technical term that I don't need to get into, uh, would take us too far afield. The urban primacy of Thailand is just off the charts. What that means is that the concentration of the population in Bangkok, in the capital city, compared to Chiang Mai, the next largest city, which is much, 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 much smaller. It's as if you have one huge urban agglomerate, which is like a magnet, bringing people in from the countryside. Whereas if you had a graduated distribution of the urban population, if you start out in a village, right, then maybe you go to a town, a small town perhaps, and then maybe to a little bigger town, and then maybe to a, a small city, and then a middle-sized city, and then finally you end up in Bangkok. But here, it's like there's a gap, a huge gap between Bangkok and the overwhelmingly rural rest of the population. Bangkok had become the tail that wagged the dog, not only of Thai politics, but of Thai culture, of the Thai economy. Uh, all power, as it were, was concentrated in, in Bangkok. Some of you remember the plays of Chekhov, right? The Cherry Orchard and others where, you know, the Russian peasants, all they're doing is dreaming of going to Moscow. Well, it's something comparable to that. Um, this is macrocephalic, huge head, Bangkok, shrunken body, the rest of Thailand. I mean, I'm exaggerating somewhat. And what that means is that in the cockpit that is Bangkok, factional disputes ramify out to the larger countryside. Battles are decided inside this one place. And so rather than a democracy which must rely, of course, on the vast mass of the population, it's almost as if the rural population, especially in the northeastern part of Thailand, was never really part of the political process. Until after the 1997 constitution and the election of 2000, Thaksin Shinawat, a tycoon, a telecommunications tycoon, was elected in a free and fair election, a democratic election, and decided to do something about the rural population and engaged in all kinds of welfare activities, transferring money and value and schools and roads and so forth down the ladder to these people who had been neglected by previous regimes, regimes that were all bound up in the politics of Bangkok rather than Thailand at large. And so here you have the demographic cleavage, and I've also now begun to mention the economic cleavage. The upper class folks, many of them colleagues and friends of mine, I have to be careful here. If I were Thai, I'd probably be with them sitting in an air-conditioned hotel, sipping coffee, talking about, I don't know, Goethe or <laughs> uh, French philosophy or whatever. These, these are, are highly educated people. Their English is better than mine. Uh, they're cosmopolitan in the extreme. They are liberal Democrats, but they haven't been outside the city limits often enough. They're stuck in that internal hothouse that is Bangkok, as it were, isolated from the rest of the population. Therefore, I say this with great regret, 
to some extent they are part of the problem, not just part of the solution. Because there's a class gap. And as soon as Thaksin Shinawat came in and mobilized the rural population, and those in the, in the countryside realized that they were getting all these benefits, they wanted to continue that way. And so when Thaksin was overthrown in a military coup in 2006, the countryside, the lower class, identifying under the color red, waving banners for Thaksin to return, became the enemies of the so-called yellows, that is to say the elite in Bangkok, resisting the rabble. A little simplified, I admit, but that's basically what happened. Now, the most sensitive explanation of all, you know, I'm not a Thai citizen. I can afford to criticize the king of Thailand. But if I do so in Bangkok, I risk, I do, I risk being charged under the Les Majeste law that is, to my knowledge, Morocco might be an exception, the most severe of any such law that exists on the face of the planet. And of course, les majeste refers to insulting the monarchy, insulting the king, criticizing the king. It's something that you shall not do. And as I say, uh, it, it doesn't just uh, operate for Thai citizens, it also operates for foreigners, especially if they're in Bangkok and they make a speech or they say something and somebody takes it down. One interesting aspect of this law is that anybody can bring suit under it, which means it's kind of open season. In other words, if I said something really nasty about the king, you know, one of you could call the Thai embassy in Bangkok. I mean, I'm, I'm serious, this is not a joke. I'm not saying you would, <laughs> but you could, and I'm not sure what would happen. Maybe in my case, I don't know, it would just be hard to get get into Thailand. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't want to really go there. And I'm not going to criticize the king, uh, at least in any sort of uh, lavish way, except to say that the king of Thailand has introduced a standard for judging performance that is deeply personal, deeply religious, Buddhist, Buddhist not Muslim, Buddhist, and not institutional at all. And that in this concept, which is associated with the mar monarchy of one Thai people, uh, based on the Buddhist religion, based on fealty to the monarchy and to the person of the king, the whole notion of conflict never acquired legitimacy. But what is democracy except institutionalized conflict? An election is necessarily conflictful if you have two parties. It's divisive. People are divided, as we will be on the 2nd of November, according to whether they vote for Democrats or Republicans. And you know, with a Tea Party out there and <laughs> counterparts perhaps on the left, I don't know, it can get pretty raucous. But the raucousness of democracy is far removed from the notion of one solid Thai people, all Buddhist, all owing allegiance to the king. And so it seems to me that the personalized and sort of spiritualized, I mean virtue, this is all about the Dhamma, which we often think of as Dharma, uh, which is a, a variation on the Sanskrit, which essentially means that if you behave virtuously, all else will follow. Uh, it's not an institutional argument, and to that extent, it seems to me it's fundamentally anti-democratic, or at least non-democratic. Um, I just want to say a couple of more things about Indonesia before I open it up. I think the irony in Indonesia is that President Suharto, who was not a Democrat, dug his own grave. He dug his own grave in the sense that by revving up the Indonesian economy, you know, with the help of foreign investors and the World Bank and so forth, it's a long story, achieving growth rates so spectacular that uh, Indonesia was at one point actually referred to as a miracle economy. You know, just the way Japan used to be, there was the Japanese miracle and then there was the South Korean miracle, the Taiwan miracle, the Thai miracle, all, all these miracles as the GDP rate got boosted up into the high single digits. <clears throat> and of course in China, 
uh, beyond the high single digits into low double digits. And that economic growth generated a middle class, which had not existed before. Now, there are two kinds of middle classes. I mean, if I can be really sort of schematic. There's the middle class that says, OK, great. We've made it. And now we won't have anything to do with politics. Politics is dirty. Let them worry about that. We'll just make, as long as we have property rights, right? Sanctity of contracts, that kind of thing. That's all we ask the state to do. Uh, in fact, some of these middle classes, including many in Southeast Asia, are even willing to accept, as would be the case in Singapore, a relatively autocratic government as long as things are stable. Predictability is more important uh, than human rights to this kind of a middle class. But there's another kind of middle class which says, well, OK, now I have property rights, but how about political rights? This goes back to the French Revolution, right? The tiers état. I want political rights as well. And so the middle class then organizes political parties and says, we don't want to be ruled by some general. Who elected you? And then democracy uh, begins to uh, arrive. And that is much closer to what happened in Indonesia. Uh, a very dynamic set of non-governmental organizations, including students demonstrating in the streets and so forth, uh, was generated um, precisely because of the success of Suharto's economic experiment. And they wanted democracy. And they ended up getting it. It's a very shortened version of what happened. And the other thing I would say is that Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, or SBY as he is known, because it's a long name to have to pronounce. Uh, we'll see how well Obama does. <laughs> uh, SBY, how can I put it? I, I don't want to appropriate him. If this is going to end up on iTunes, I don't want the Indonesian ambassador. You know, we got the Thai ambassador already, maybe. <laughs> or I'm exaggerating, actually. None of them probably would even want to bother, would even know that I exist, I suppose. But in any case, um, on the Indonesian side, um, it is fair to say, uh, however it might embarrass an Indonesian diplomat a little bit, it is fair to say that no president of Indonesia has ever had USA more prominently written on his own curriculum vitae, his resume. Uh, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono went to several higher educational institutions in the United States. He had military training in the US. He has a higher degree uh, from the United States. His English is good. Uh, he's comfortable with Americans. I'm not saying he picked up the democratic virus while he was here and has now exported it back to his country. Uh, that would be, I think, much, uh, much too simple. But he is genuinely a Democrat and con committed to the democratic process in an institutional way. In fact, the criticism of SBY, if anything now, is that he is too respectful, in particular, of parliament which is corrupt in Indonesia, highly corrupt, and full of all kinds of politicians that are at the heart of what Indonesians call money politics. And there, are, there were demonstrations against SBY just recently in the streets, but nothing like what happened in Bangkok. No violence, uh, no huge you know, tear gas and all of that. No, these were peaceful demonstrations on the part of individuals that felt that, uh, that uh, uh, SBY, Cecilo, was not doing enough to fight corruption, for example. Corruption that, that is, is bred inside government institutions to fight impunity. And when I say impunity, I'm referring, for example, to members of the military uh, against whom clear and plausible cases could be made that they engaged in all manner of crimes, uh, including major crimes in the history of East Timor, which was occupied by Indonesia in the mid-1970s, uh, and finally uh, released itself in a referendum in 1999. I happened to have been an observer at that time for the Carter Center. I was evacuated from, from Dili as it was in flames. It was a very tragic experience, and a large number of people were killed at that time. And most recently, we've had a video surface just about a week ago showing Indonesian military personnel engaged in torture in the easternmost province of Indonesia, which is Papua, located right here at the far eastern end of the archipelago. Um, but the good news is that the video circulated, and the government didn't ban it. Uh, 
it is, it is available. I don't know if it's still available. I have to check. I didn't do that this morning. Uh, but the free press in Indonesia has been very, very important in trying to expose uh, instances of this, of this kind and to cover uh, issues involving particularly corruption. So the criticism of SBY, he has a PhD, uh, you know, like Obama. He's a former professor, uh, for better or worse. <laughs> I don't know if former professors make good presidents or not. I won't go there. But uh, uh, although it was, it was William Buckley, right, who once said that he would prefer to be governed by 100 names chosen at random from the Boston phone book than by the entire Harvard faculty. <laughs> but that was, that was Harvard, not Stanford. Well, that was Harvard. <laughs> Anyway, uh, the criticism of SBY is that he, 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 he takes too long to make up his mind. He's indecisive. And he's not willing to stand up against the corruption of Indonesian institutions by politicians that really just are interested in lining their pockets. But the very fact that this kind of a debate is taking place in Indonesia, and it's a civil debate within the context of political stability, is quite encouraging, certainly vastly more encouraging than the rather sad story that I've shared with you with regard to Thailand. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.